so far we have covered the origin and the foundation and, and concept behind the SPC theory its relationship to the Six Sigma concept and quality control and we're now going to look at the different SPC control charts you can use and how do they apply in the real life. Let's start with the definition of a control chart. So keep in mind first that in the 20s people had to derive those calculations by hand and they were actually using paper and, and, and pencils to actually draw those charts manually and, and do that. Now we have computers and all of that could be done automatically but it was kind of a tedious procedure to do that manually uh, almost 100 years ago. So at the center of the chart we'll see what we call the center line which could correspond to the mean value over the period of time we're looking at or that could be the target value. So we'll see the difference later on how we're going to decide whether to use the actual mean value or the target value for the center line. Then there is going to be other lines, the upper control limit and the lower control limit, those defined as being the three sigma limits. And beside that we'll have the upper specification limits and the lower specification limits from which we could derive the CP and CPK value. These limits are either chosen or calculated so that most of the data, most of the sample or aggregates, SPC aggregates you're going to put into the chart will fall within the limits when the process is considered under control. Very few points will be outside the limits because as we know from theory only 0.3% of the point will normally fall outside the limits when we just have random variation occurring in the process. Here is an example of a pi control chart where you can see the center line here being defined, the upper control limit, 3 sigma control limit, the lower control limit, and with a dotted line the upper specification limit and the lower specification limit used to calculate the CP and CPK. On this chart we have three zones. The first zone is the one around the center line, the zone C, which encompasses all the data falling between minus and, and plus one sigma from the center line. Then we have the green zone, which is zone B, which just encompasses the data will fall between plus one and plus two sigma or minus one and minus two sigma from the center line. Last zone being the zone A, this yellow zone where the data falls between plus two and plus three sigma or minus two and minus three sigma from the center line. And there could be a zone, an unknown zone, <laughs> Where, when the data is out of the limits, okay, and this one is not showed up on this trend, but it does exist also. So, as a note here, this sigma display on the trend could be either the real sigma derived from the calculation, or it could be simply the upper control limit minus the center line divided by 3, and same thing for the other one, the control limit center line minus the lower control limit divided by 3. So this means that depending how you specify this upper control limit as being a constant or being the actual 3 sigma derived from the statistic of the distribution, uh, that could mean different thing. Okay, you could also have non-symmetric zone if the difference between UCL and CL is not equal to the difference between CL and LCL. This is an important note about how the data is displayed on the trend for those SQC trend in Pi. Because we're thinking about a number of sample being individual values or aggregates in the trend, uh, you have to keep in mind that the SPC theory has been developed for discrete manufacturing when people were working with parts, hardware parts, and there was no time relationship between the different sample. So you had a new sample, you would just plot it on the graph 
and wait for the next sample to be tested and plot it again on the graph. Now all those points is going to be sample extracted from a time series. Okay, so we do know from those continuous process that there is a relationship between those data because they've been gathered over a period of time. Okay, however, depending how the data is getting into the Pi server, this time relationship doesn't mean that they're going to be equidistant in time. So we'll still plot them as if they were discrete sample with no time relationship but it doesn't mean that the time elapsed between two consecutive sample is the same all over the trend. So just be careful of that because the space between two posts could be a few minutes or a few hours depending how you got the sample and how the data is getting into the Pi server.